Okay, so th thank you uh, everyone for, for, for coming to and being here. Uh, today I'd like to talk about almost Ramanujan expanders from arbitrary expanders via operator amplification. So it's a long title. Can you start slowly because oh. I, I forgot my pen. Okay. okay. <laughs> I can wait for a little bit. Yeah, so we, we have this very long title. Uh, one thing that's important in this title is going to be this arbitrary from an expander and, and this technique that is operator amplification. And we also need to say what Ramanujan means. So we have a lot, a, lot, a lot of things to explain in this title. So our main theorem. Uh, and this is going to be a joint work with um, uh, Tuchant Mittal from New Chicago, uh, Suya Roy from UC Riverside, and uh, Avi here. And uh, our main result is stated very informally, it is like this. So every expanded graph. And the graph it can be transformed into an almost option. Uh, into an almost option. So at a very formal level, this is the main result that we prove, and uh, we need to make it more precise, right? What do we mean by this almost option here, right? Uh, and whenever we talk about expanders, we need to talk about infinite family of expanders. But to keep things simple, let, let, let's say let's say for a single expander. So our main result is going to be to describe this theorem and make this theorem more precise and, and more quantitative as we go. Is the intuitive statement for what being transformed means? Yeah, that, that, that's a very good question, right? Because we can always, someone give us an expander, oh, and you will throw this expander, and you take an LPS expander and give to the person, right? This is the best that you can. So you, you need to somehow, for, for a theorem like this to be interesting, you need to preserve some structural properties of, of this expander. And uh, as you are going to describe the transformation, it's going to be clear that we preserve a lot of the, the structural properties of, of this expander. So if you start with some KD graph over some group, it remains a KD graph over the same group, for instance. And it's not going to create transitions that uh, are not implied, that are not short walks in the original graph. But it's going to preserve the structure also in the sense. But it's really important to, to preserve the, the structure in some sense, right? All right, so, so <laughs> and, uh, let's start from, from the beginning and then set some notation, right? Uh, so, uh, uh, some, some expanders one on one, and I imagine that for, for most of you, this is going to be very familiar. So, this is mainly to set some notation. And uh, here we are given a graph X on some vertex set and some collection of uh, edges. Here, we are going to always assume that, that the graph is irregular, that that's going to make the theorem much easier. Uh, and uh, Okay, one important object that you associate to the graph is the, the, the normalized adjacency matrix. So you can associate a matrix like this. So this is going to be the normalized adjacency matrix, so, so such that the, the entry uh, ij of this matrix is going to be one over the degree, it's normalized. And, and then the indicator whether ij is an edge in your graph. So this, this is the normalized adjacency matrix, right? Uh, so I J they, they range in, in the vertex set. So to, to, to give a very small example, we, we have the example of a triangle, right? Uh, and in a triangle, uh, you're going to have a matrix that's like this. The, the vertex is not connected to itself, but it's connected to the two other uh, guys in the graph. So you're not connected to itself, but connected to the two other guys and, and these. And since you're, you're normalizing, you need to normalize by the degree. But the degree in this example is true. So we have something that's one over two, and then that, that's normalized adjacent matrix of the key this um, triangle here. Okay, very good. So uh, we, we have this real symmetric matrix, right? Uh, and uh, we, we know that the rows, they form a probability distribution, right? They, they sum to one. So uh, uh, in particular, 
what, what uh, so it, it tells us about the eigenvalues. So that we, we know that uh, let's say that this guy is, is an any vertex graph. And then we, we can sort the eigenvalues, and you know that uh, the, the largest one is going to be at most one. So you have lambda one, uh, lambda two, and, and so on, right? Um, and then sort them, and they, they are between one and minus one. And a very important direction for us is, is this all one direction, right? Uh, so here we can take a vector that's uh, still one, since you're playing with a irregular graph. This guy is always an eigenvector to eigenvalue one of the normalized adjacent matrix, right? Uh, so this is simply a vector for ones. This is a vector in R. Yeah, right there. Uh, and then when you take a normalized adjacent matrix of a graph, you apply to this all ones, uh, we rip over the all ones here. Right uh, So it's telling us that uh, actually here, lambda one is equal to one. We always have this, very good. We we'll always have this equality. And uh, at a very formal level, what you want for, from an expander, right? Uh, typically, we want two opposing properties, right? Uh, Expanders at the qualitative level. Oh, you want two things. You, you want the graph to be uh, well connected. And, and the second property that you want is, is the graph to be sparse. Right? Uh, typically, you want to combine the two properties for, for an expander. And very good. Uh, so, so here we, we know that one is realized. Very good. Then let's give an example. Let's decompose this adjacent matrix here. It's very easy, right? We are going to have something like this. So this is the all ones here, all ones uh, uh, and dagger. And then minus the identity. So minus the identity matrix here. Right? Uh, and, and the eigenvalues here are, are going to be lambda one is going to be one. And lambda two and lambda three are going to be minus a half. This becomes easy to, to, to see from, from this decomposition. And uh, one way of quantifying it, the, the expansion is, is, is through the, the spectral road, right? So we are going to, to consider things in, uh, spectrally. And uh, we can associate this parameter here. So the, this is the, the, the spectral expansion. Uh, the, this parameter here, lambda x, is going to be the maximum of the absolute value of the second one. So here we have lambda two, and here we have lambda in here. So we will quantify by this, the, 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 the notion of spectral expansion. And we, we say that we have a lambda expander when the parameter is at most lambda. So the, the notion of lambda expander for the stock, this is spectral. So whenever lambda x uh, is at most lambda. And notice because of our normalization, there's going to be a number between zero and one. A number between zero and one. And uh, let's try to gain some feeling about what, what this is trying to capture, right? Uh, and uh, what, what you're going to see is that the, the smaller is this expansion parameter, the, the more well connected is the graph, right? Uh, at least in a spectral sense. So let's. Uh, let's so uh, we not we not we not, not only know that we have uh, something that uh, the eigenvalues that uh, apply in this interval, but we also have another normal basis of eigenvectors, right? Uh, so here, uh, by the spectral theorem, we we also get a more normal basis of eigenvectors, right? Uh, so this is uh, some double y. I want to train, right? Uh, and and, and in this basis, of what you can write, the, the adjacent matrix of this guy can, can be expressed as something like this. Uh, so here we're going to have this lambda one, uh, lambda two, et cetera, all the way to uh, lambda n, right? Uh, so in this basis, it becomes fully diagonal. And the good mental picture that, 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 uh, that you people would like to have is uh, like this lambda one is one, right? Uh, and all the other guys, they're they going to be an absolute value at most of lambda. So if this lambda is rather small, 
And as you take powers of, of this adjacent matrix, you're going to have a very fast exponential decay. If lambda is bound away from one, you will have a very nice exponential decay. So they did this is one way that lambda is always good, right? Uh, and then another way that lambda is is, is good for us is that uh, we can write in the original base, right? So uh, you're going to have something like this. Mention I push one to n, and then here have this lambda one, uh, w i, w i uh, dagger. We can single out lambda i, we can single out the first one, right? Uh, this is going to be to give us the L ones, L ones dagger, uh, divided by n, and then everything else, right? So I from two uh, to n, and then this lambda i, uh, double i, uh, double i uh, transpose. And if lambda is small, it, it's as if this part is going to be quite negligible. So in terms of operator norms, so what, what we get is that this adjacent matrix behaves very similarly to, 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 to this guy. And the, what, what is this guy? This is the adjacent matrix of a complete graph uh, with self-loop. Self so it's something that's very well connected. Right then. So it, it behaves as something very complete. Uh, so uh, as long as the, the rest of the lambda, the lambda parameter is small, this is behaving as a very complete thing. And now we can make our wish list for an expander more quantitative, right? Uh, so we, uh, we, we ask the graph to be well connected and sparse. And one way of realizing that is to say, okay, now we can make a quantitative version of this. Uh, expanders. A quantitative version. And uh, by, by well connected now, what, what you mean, you can say that lambda is small. Sorry, I didn't catch that word that you're saying. Oh, which one? Qualitative quantitative, sorry. Oh, oh so, so uh, when you think about expanders, we typically want two opposing properties uh, at an informal level. We want the graph to be quite well connected, but at the same time, it would be trivial to take a complete graph. Right, it would be spending a lot of pages. It would be very dense. So you would like to have a graph that somehow exhibits some properties of being well connected, but, but uh, at the same time being quite sparse. So that, that's kind of the magic that, that uh, expanders uh, can do. And uh, yeah, so well connected can mean several things, right? No sparse cuts and so on. So when you go through to this spectral sense and the, the, this lambda parameter becomes quite small, what you're saying is that the adjacent matrix of your graph, at least in your greater norm, it's very close to this uh, all ones, our product of all ones, divided by n. And, and this is the adjacent matrix of a complete graph with self loops. It's as connected as, as, as possible. But you're doing that with a small degree. So that's uh, okay. So now here uh, we have the degree. We also want the degree to be small. Because the degree is controlling, it's controlling the number of edges. Right? Uh, so now this became more quantitative, right? Uh, and uh, you can imagine that. Uh, if the degree is very small, the, the, the graph may not be well connected, right? So, so the, 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 there is tension between lambda and the degree, right? Uh, and uh, the, the, we can ask, well, what is the best trade-offs, right? Uh, and we, we have some sort of lower bound, right? Uh, given by the alumbo bound. So we have the alumbo And uh, in terms of the degree, the alumbo tells us that uh, if you have an infinite family of, uh, well, let's say, bounded graphs, so what you're going to have is something that the, 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 the expansion parameter cannot be extremely good, right? Uh, we always need to pay something like this, square root of d minus one, uh, divided by d, and here minus some little term that's going to vanish as the number of, of words increase. So what is this telling us that if you want to have good expansion, you need to invest a lot of, in terms of the degree, because you have this lower bound. So said it in an alternative way, if you want to get a lambda expander, uh, you, you need to pay the, the degree of the graph, you need to invest. And we think the degree is then resource, how much we are paying for this expander might be something that's one over lambda squared. So morally you have a quadratic trade-off. So if you want to get a lambda expander, you need to pay, you need to invest in terms of the degree. The graph needs to be sufficiently dense for that. So that, 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 that's what is known. Uh, so they did this down upon a bound. And uh, there are graphs that achieve amazing parameters uh, in terms of these, right? Uh, and we'll, let's see. How...
So uh, we will have this as a lower bound, right? Uh, but uh, we, we also have something that's called the Ramanujan bound. And the Ramanujan bound asks that this lambda parameter be at most two square root of d minus one uh, divided by d. And if you have a graph that satisfies this, a family of graph that satisfies this, it's called a Ramanujan family. Those are the so-called Ramanujan graphs. And that's the best possible for an infinite family because of the lower bound that we have there. And the Ramanujan graphs are sort of in terms of the degree of expansion trade-off, they are the best of the best. That, that you can achieve. It and be, be there exists X such that that is that, right? There, there exists X. The bond just means there exists a graph that attains this. It, it's going to be a family of infinite sure. graphs, the degrees, and so on. It's sure. very flat. It's not for X. There exists it, an X. No, no, no. It, 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 the, the more precise the statement is. There exists X. That's right. There exists X. It, 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 for every graph. No, no, no. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not true for, for every graph. It, 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 the Ramanujan graphs establish yes, that yes. for a family. So just for right, there exists X, because then it becomes incompatible with Alambopana. Uh, Alambopana says for every X. It, that, that's for every graph, yes, yes. It, it, it's not saying oh, 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 it, there is a family. So yeah. there is a family of graph. So the, and, and this is the regular, and, and, and this is bounded. Uh, okay, so you, you are thinking about D being bounded, you have this infinite family, but you are not making an assumption of. Uh, but yeah, and uh, yeah, so th th this is the Ramanujan bound, and uh, Lubots, Phillips, and Sarnak in, in the 80s, in 88, the, 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 they showed explicit constructions, uh, and, and also Margulis. So they showed explicit. Um, Constructions like this. And uh, those graphs are used a lot in theoretical computer science. It's not always that we, we really need this kind of trade off, but if you're going to use some graph, it, you might as well take the best, right? Uh, take something that um, uh, satisfies this Ramanujan bound. And um, uh, a lot of results were known, right? In the beginning of, of uh, the series of expander, people wanted to understand when you get an expander graph without being careful with the trade offs. And Pinsker showed that for a regular graph, and also I think it, now there's also thing that Komugorov also showed this result that uh, random graphs are quite good. And Margulis got the first one, that that uh, first explicit one, and and, and then later the, 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 we improved our understanding. And here they, they use group theory to, 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 to get these. There's going to be some Cayley graphs that achieve this, and uh, uh, very good. And then um, and, and and after this, people try to to get this Ramanujan bound by other techniques. And uh, a bunch of techniques appeared, right? Uh, and you are not going to survey all of them. And our understanding of how to construct expanders improved a lot. So now we have several ways of, of constructing expanders. And let, let's not try to survey all of them, but uh, let's say. So now we understand way better. And uh, one particularly important technique to, to, to construct expanders is, is this lifting technique of, of blue aluminium. And this technique also led to some Ramanujan graphs. Uh, another very important technique for us, for, for our work, is going to be the zigzag, which is a very combinatorial technique. And unfortunately, it's not often. It's not going to give us this quadratic trade-off per se. Right? Uh, and, and there is, a, so this is from Rengo, the Vodan, um, and Vic Derson, in the 2000s. And uh, generalizing the zigzag, uh, there is a higher order version of the zigzag uh, designed to construct a specific uh, almost Ramanujan graphs. So th th this is a result of Ben Arroyo. Oh, yeah, and, and, and Tashmi, 2008, around 2008. Okay, so. Uh, and uh, for, for our work, those two results are going to be crucial for us. We are going to really build on top of zigzag ideas, zigzag based ideas. And here they construct almost from illusion, but uh, uh, for, for specific graphs. Okay. And the, 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 there are a lot of extremely nice work, uh, works around this Ramanujan bound or, or construction expanders, but let's not try to survey them all. And uh, okay, uh, 
question so far? Uh, so let's try to state our main theorem in a more quantitative way. Um, and so uh, uh, what we prove is going to be like this. And the uh, W. So here you're giving some expander uh, lambda uh, x, which is a denot regular uh, lambda not expander. And the lambda not is, is some constant. And again, here we need to talk about an infinite family, but let, let's keep things simple. So you are giving this guy as, as your input. And for, for any target lambda that you want to achieve, any target expansion that you want to achieve, uh, we can efficiently transform Transform X into uh, a lambda expander, which is the desired expansion that you want to achieve, uh, the lambda expander uh, X prime, um, over, over a degree uh, here uh, at most. So here we're going to write some dependence on the north, which we're thinking as, as a constant. So here you have lambda square and plus some little alter. Okay, so uh, I'm not giving a lot of details of how the transformation, I'm just making some parameters more precise. So you are giving a, this the regular graph, that's a lambda not expander. You're thinking about lambda not as, as a constant. We need to Strictly speaking, you should think family of, of expanders. Uh, for any target lambda that you want, th there is some very efficient transformation, depending on the case, that uh, allows us to get a lambda expander. And the, the degree is good. If you think that lambda naught is a constant, right? Uh, in case that lambda naught is, is some big O of one, what you get out of this would be something that has a, a, about the correct rate of, of uh, a two plus zero. And uh, this little O is, um, yeah, if you want to share curves about the little O, it's going to look something like this, one over log, uh, one over lambda, to, 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 to the C. You can see some constant is smaller than one. So <laughs> there are many. So in this study of Ramanujan graphs, the, 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 we, we can, like, uh, I don't know, potentially get the exact Ramanujan bound. But you can get several kinds of approximations, right? Uh, so uh, another approximation that I need to make is that an important result of Friedman uh, around 2003 is that if you take a random regular graph, so it's the random uh, the, the, the regular graph, uh, it's going to achieve a parameter that uh, it's very close to the Ramanujan bound, and the quality is very good. So this is through the uh, minus one divided by d. Uh, plus, plus some little term that then vanishes with him. So we, it, 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 if you ask the question, how abundant are things that are close to our moving bound, they, they, they are very abundant. At least generically, you can get one. So that, that's a, a result for, for a random graph that was proven in particular. And, and people prove this with some polylog errors and uh, we've had a shift approximation errors and so on. So this is a weak form of random right? Uh, so you, you're getting this, this uh, square, but that there is a little uh, in there. Okay. So th these are our main uh, theorems, and uh, it's going to follow on a more uh, a more technical result. Um, so the, the, the more technical result is going to be uh, you're going to generalize a technique of Tashma. Generalization. So it's going to be an operator generalization of, uh, of Tashman's technique, then I'm going to detail it more. Which means amplification. And uh, so why is the theorem, that, uh, the main technical theorem that you prove? In our level. Uh, so this is the technical, main technical. And uh, here you are given some parameters. So let's uh, 
you're, you're getting some uh, constant lambda naught. Lambda naught belong to zero one. Um, we, we are given some uh, dimension parameter L. Okay. Uh, so we, we are given, yeah, and we are given some sort of, of degree parameter as some, some finite set. So, so some S, that's a finite set. So that's our input. And, and then again, for, for any target lambda that you want, the lambda belonging to zero one, uh, we, we can efficiently construct some collection of tuples. Uh, construct W here containing some mass to the P, so some, some, some collection of tuples uh, such that the size of this collection is about the right size. So uh, the size of this collection is going to be order to be small. So the right a little bit bigger. A little bit bigger. So uh, the, the size of this collection is going to be about lambda naught. Here you have S. Here you have lambda squared plus zero O of one. So we, we have something like this, and uh, we're going to argue that this is about the, the right size. And such that uh, for every function. Could write bigger, it would help a lot. Uh, it's hard to read. Oh, it's hard, hard, hard to read here. Yeah, because I move to to make it bigger. Make it bigger. Yeah. Make it bigger. Yeah. Make it bigger. Yeah. It's fine. Handwriting just make it. It's what we wouldn't be. Yeah. So let me. Okay. <clears throat> so let, let, let me. But I want to keep it. Uh, let, let, let me try to write over there. Probably want to keep this. Let me try to write over there a little bit bigger. Uh, so our, the, the main technical result that we prove is like this. And we'll, let me know if this is big enough. And uh, here I'm giving L. Uh, let S be a finite set. So here you're giving a constant lambda naught. In this interval, and, and you're giving a dimension parameter. Is this better? No. Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, for any target lambda, if you run out of space, you can get all this continue in the board that is under the right height. So, for any target lambda that you want, uh, we, we can efficiently construct. efficiently construct a collection W of tuples of length P. And this P is going to be morally, I don't know, there's a dependence on epsilon, but it's going to be log uh, one over lambda. Okay, so we, we have this, uh, and such so, so, so that this collection has the, the, about the correct size. And uh, what, what correct size means? So this is uh, the knot. S, and then here we have lambda two plus a little old term. And uh, oh, 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 okay, so we have the, this is about the correct size. And for every function here, so whenever you take some function f from S, from this finite set S, to, to the collection of L by L matrices over C, um, there is a technical condition here. But let, let me put an asterisk and then just potentially say what is the technical condition. Uh, if, if the average of the bias, um, if you look at the, the average of this function, this collection, little s, long to f of s, of f of s, and you look at the operator norm of this, if this is smaller than lambda naught, uh, what you can show is that. Uh, if you construct the longer average here, so here, expectation of uh, you have S1, et cetera, S T. So this is a tuple in, in our collection. And then here you have F of S1, et cetera, 
all the way through FSP. And you look at the operator norm of this guy. Uh, this is at most limited. Okay. So, so the, the text indexations are uniform. Uniform. We think that the S is actually a multi pad yeah. and uh, it, it's going to be flat on S. Okay. So it, it's uniform on S. So the, 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 this is the main technical theorem, and you're going to understand why it's zero. You allow multi sets. Oh, allow multi sets. Yes, yeah, so then it's any. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But then you can approximate right. all your distributions. Same with the operator normals. Yeah, so the, 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 you're going to have some Hilbert spaces, right? As also, so here, I don't know. Abstract matrix, so. It's, a, it's going to be the, the largest singular value of this matrix. Largest singular value of, of this matrix. Okay. Yeah, so uh, here we think that we have situ L, that's sort of our Hilbert space under the, the usual near product, right? Uh, and uh, we are looking at the largest uh, singular value of this matrix. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And here, I'm going to explain why, why something like this might be useful. Uh, so okay. it may, may not be clear. And what, what you're doing here, right? Uh, so we start with some, uh, we have some finite set S, we have a constant lambda naught, and we have a dimension parameter. So for any target lambda that you want to achieve in terms of amplification, we think that lambda naught is a constant, and lambda is something much, much smaller. So we are amplifying the, 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 the bias, let, let's say this generalized version of bias from lambda naught, all the way to lambda. And how you're amplifying the bias, right? So you're going to construct some collection of tuples, W containing S to the T. And this collection W is important, the, the size of this collection W, and you're going to see why the, the, this collection is important, such that whenever you take a function that, that's mapping on elements of S to matrices, now it's L by L matrices, then if the average, or if you compute the average of this function, the, the, the operator norm, it has a small eigenvalue, let, let's say, small singular value. It's at most lambda naught. Now you're going to construct some sort of an amplified function. And uh, what wh 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 is the new average that we compute? You look at this collection of tuples, right? Uh, and you're going to multiply the functions along the elements of the tuple, right? So we have here pi fs1, which pi with fs2, all the way to fst. And this is going to give us a new average, right? Uh, a new average. And, and we are saying that it's at most lambda. So th this is the main tag for result, and you're going to see wh why such a thing might be interesting. But with, with this, you can prove a lot, a lot of things with something like this. Okay. Uh, qu qu questions about this? Sorry, you need to explain the asterisk or not? I, I can explain the asterisk. Uh, if, you're, if you don't plan. I, I plan, I plan. <laughs> it's a, a simple condition, but because of space. So you want the, the, the operator norm of the individual matrices to be at most one. Well, let's say that one lies first and then they are at most one. Because otherwise things could explode. Uh, so, so right. your bottom, that's you're, you're taking the expectation of the multiplication of those matrices, just to change some. Yeah, yeah. This is going to be a matrix, and this is going to be a matrix here. Right? You, you can think, I don't know, one scenario to think is that you are given you might be given a matrix that uh, it's actually an average of other matrices, right? Uh, I don't know, S belongs to S and it's same S. Right? Uh, so let, let's say that your matrix is given as an average of other matrices. So the, 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 here we'll be saying that this we have a function that maps C0S to, 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 to this MS. Right? Uh, but we have a matrix that's given like this. And uh, we, we know that if you take powers of this, if you raise this to the T, and if this has a small operator norm, the operator norm is going to shrink. Right? Uh, but what our theorem is giving us is that uh, it's giving us the, the correct amplification, but we, we may be, the, the blow up in the degree is going to be much better. If you do this thing naively, right? Uh, what is going to be the support of the distribution? It's going to be S to the P. We have a huge blow up in the support. So you want it to be a very efficient way of derandomizing powers. That's uh, where this is coming from. What is L, actually? L is the dimension, right? It's, it's, a, it's an L by L matrix. Oh, okay. And notice that the curious feature of this is that L does not appear anywhere else, right? Uh, it's just to give a name to, to, to the matrix that appear here. But it, 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 the amplification happens regardless of the value of L. L could be two, a hundred, a thousand, a million. The hidden nodes don't have any L. No, no, it's completely, it's, it, it's dimension independent, this kind of problem. Uh, it's a... Uh, if W is uh, S to the T, is it like easy to get that? Uh, if W, this is a trivial W, and you're going to explore this one. Yes. 
it's going to happen. Amplification is going to happen because it's going to be like a, 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 a taking the powers of a matrix, right? Uh, so if you have a matrix like this, you're going to have something like this. So amplification would happen. Uh, Just making sure I'm getting this. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the asset in the analogy are the edges. W is a set of pseudo random walks. S is going to be vertices later on. At this point, it's better to do this as an abstract theorem that you have some finite set S, you have a function, a matrix valued function on this set. And if the average of this function in terms of operator norms at most lambda naught, when you do something like this, you get lambda. So it's some form of the randomized powering of matrix. With uh, in a very efficient way, support efficient way. Okay, you don't want to like show the analogy. I should I only think of this as an abstract now. No, you, you, you are going to, 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 to go gradually and, and say uh, you are going to see proofs. It's going to become more concrete as, as we go. Uh, but uh, later on, you are going to, to S is going to be the vertex set of something. But it's okay. going to give spoilers. <laughs> So W is a, a three long sequence of vertices. Yeah, right? W is more analogous to edges or potentially blocks. Uh, but I'm are, giving spoilers. Okay. Uh, these are spoilers. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. So the, the, at this point, it's good to think that W is an abstract uh, sub collection of doubles of S to the T. It may arise in several different ways. Hopefully, mm -hmm. okay. uh, I'm going to ask you about the only thing that is written in a tiny font. Okay. It's an amplification. If you have something like this that had some. Uh, he's just asking what yeah, the, the bound can read. But, but, but uh, he's just going to tell me the answer, right? Uh, what, what you would expect, right? Uh, so it's at most lambda not by something, right? Uh, and when you raise this to the P, right? Uh, what, what would be the operator norm of this? It's going to be at most lambda not. To, to, to the P. So you would expect P to be about log of uh, lambda naught lambda. Or, or if lambda naught is a constant, it's, it's about one log one over lambda. What, what you would expect if you're doing this, this power? Okay, so this also doesn't depend on L. Mm, it's weird. <laughs> it depends on L. Right, uh, yeah. But W. Can depend on L. So I. So a single W amplifies in finite many things. Okay, so L appears in a weird place. Oh, so the, the L is picked later. <laughs> Same W, I don't know. Uh, completely oblivious, right? You can't find the W. Why does L appear at. Isn't it for L? It's just to give a name, that's just to say that the matrix that you have, they are all L by L such that multiplication of matrix makes sense. But could you, could you flip the quantifiers and say if I gave you a family of Fs for each L, you would just put. I'll put a single W that would be a single W, yes, yes. Yeah. So if I'll put a W for L equals to two, it works for L equals three, that works with L equals to five, and so even stronger than what is written. Oh, potentially, potentially. <laughs> it's universal in the sense you find one, one W and it's going to be for infinite many things. Okay, so let, let, let's uh, let's use the hope to improve this theorem and get a actual recommendation stuff. Yeah, if, if you want to get that one stuff, you need to work on the zero term here. And uh, in this construction, it might require slightly new ideas, potentially. Uh, but you need to, to remove this. But then you need another button. This is the only button. Uh... The construction has moving pieces. It's based on this time orders exact product. So if you try to improve on one side, it gets worse than other shit. I think people have tried, but, but it's a good question, right? Uh, to, to get, uh, I don't know, co co in instead of this little constant times that. Right? Uh, OK. So let's now start with why such a modification is interesting, right? Uh, and the way we can start with an easy case, right? Uh, uh, but, 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 not easy case. Let, let, let's start with the scalar case, right? Uh, so that should prove this result when we are mapping to plus minus one functions. So uh, the, the scalar case, scalar. Uh, plus minus one. Some people put later for four scalars over C, Jalan uh, Moshkovitz. And uh, the case that Tashma considered was this one, plus minus one. So fu functions that are plus minus one of this one. And this is already extremely used when he got uh, almost all from old close to the GV bond, right? We were much more And let's start from more familiar waters and let's see why 
it's it, it would be useful to have something like this right there. And uh, one thing that you can start with is with expanders uh, with scaling graphs, right? Uh, so here. And the uh, uh, Eric's useful way. I don't understand what you're saying there. Huh? Okay. 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 What is it? It's one dimensional matrix. Yeah, this will be the case of one. But uh, um, more than that, it's going to be plus minus one matrix. So, in, in this theorem, we typically have a function that might, might map to matrices that are larger dimension. But you can map to scalars, right, instead of matrices, the case that they're all equals one. So, a particular case of this theorem is, is when you have functions of this form. When a, 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 this is a particular form of L equals one. You have functions that are plus minus one value. I don't know how, how you use that kind of uh, L, L equals one. Yeah, we are, we are going to see why L equals one is already very interesting, I did in my opinion. So, uh, okay. And uh, we will allow us to motivate the transition to, to, to why matrices are also interesting to look at. Uh, yeah, so, a, a, a very useful way of constructing graphs is the construction of Cayley graphs, right? Uh, and uh, we, we have seen a Cayley graph already right uh, in this presentation. And uh, a Cayley graph, typically, you, you have a group G, right? Uh, and you're going to play, let, let's say, mostly with finite groups. And uh, we typically take some, some set of generators, right? Uh, this is a generator set. Right? And uh, so sometimes convenient to have a graph, or some that's closed on the inverses. But you have the two things, a group and the set, a generating set of this group. Right? Uh, and uh, it's convenient to, 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 to form what is called this, the Cayley graph, right? Uh, and the Cayley graph we, we, the, of this group of this generating set is the graph. Where the, the, the vertex set is G, right? Uh, and uh, the, the, the transitions are going to be given by, by the edges here. So we, we denote this by Cayley, uh, G, S, and the vertex set is, is G. And the edge set of this, this guy is going to be something like this. So you're going to have a collection of G, S times G. And here G ranges in your group, and the group. And, and, and S ranges in your generating set. Okay, so this is going to be the set of the KD graph. So um, I don't know. Uh, you have G here. And we, we take all the transitions. So let's say that S is equal to some S1, all the way to some SN. And, and, and then you take transitions like this, S1, S2, right? Uh, whenever you can reach this SN. So it gives a very natural way of constructing KD graphs. And you have some one example of a KD graph already so the picture on the board. And what was the, the, the time example that we have given of a KD graph? Like very good, the, the, the triangle, right? And, and the, what is the group and what is the generating set? Yeah, very good. Very good. Uh, what is a blog KD graph of computer scientists? What is a KD graph that you love, right? Uh, Okay. The Boolean hypercube, right? Uh, <laughs> another example is the, the K cube. So that, that's the Boolean cube. And this is what is the K graph over Z2 to the K. And the generating sets are the, the basis vectors, right? Um, okay, so those are two very. Uh, Useful examples for us, right? Uh, the the K cube and, and this. And uh, let's try to understand what, what happens. So, when you have a KD graph over an abelian group, it's very well behaved. Uh, well, uh, let's consider a more general KD graph over the two to the K, right? Uh, let, 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 let's start with something like this K and uh, the two to the K, and some sort of generating set S. And uh, let's suppose that it, it's a lambda not expander. Let's say that the lambda parameter of this guy, uh, let, let's give this the name x, and lambda x is at most some lambda naught. What exactly this means, right? Uh, so we know that uh, the, the, the Fourier basis diagonalizes the adjacent matrix of this guy, right? Uh, so in, in, in the Fourier basis, 
So we can express this uh, in the Fourier basis. Let's write uh, the, the Fourier basis as something like this, chi t, and then um, b is going to be subsets of k. Let's index the, the blue things by, by sets. Right, uh, we have the, the Fourier basis. And the adjacent matrix of this guy under the Fourier basis is going to be diagonal, right? Uh, any graphs of Harbinian groups are amazing because of this. And uh, how it's going to look like, right? Uh, it's going to be a diagonal matrix such, such that in the entry, let, let's say in the top entry, you're going to have S going to S of chi, the empty set. And the empty set is the trivial uh, character of S. And then potentially here, you might have a single set, S going to S. I of one quadrated uh, the S, with the S, and then so on and so forth. We have all, all, all the characters appear in the diagram, the evaluations of the characters, the, the average of the characters when they're degenerating is that, okay, S, and, uh, and zeros. It becomes diagonal like this, right? Uh, so the, the, the condition of this guy being a lambda not expanded, this guy is a trivial character. It always evaluates one. So what we have is something that's going to be one and all, all, all the other characters, right? Uh, and we can re read the, 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 the diagonal values out of the diagonal, right? Uh, so all diagonal values are here and you're seeing that in absolute value, the diagonal values are at most lambda not, right? Uh, this is the condition of being a lambda uh, expander. There's a bunch of zeros, a bunch of zeros, right? Uh, so this condition here is, is equivalent to, to the condition of uh, the, the, the expectation over the set of generators S of chi T S uh, in absolute value is at most lambda naught. Um, uh, at most lambda naught for all, not no empty set, right? Uh, when T is not the empty set, not the trivial character. We have this condition. And uh, this is on one side an expander, this is on the other side, a very important object in pseudorandomness, right? Uh, and what is the name of this object in the theory of pseudorandomness? So you're going, to, you're, you're going to, to, to describe three different perspectives on the same object uh, that, that are equivalent, that, that have different names. So one was this uh, lambda expander over the church decay. And we saw that this is equivalent to pooling characters. So if you have a Boolean function that's supported on a few number of characters, uh, you, you can use some distribution like this to pull the characters, right? You're going to incur more, small error. So it's, it's a very useful object in pseudorandomness. And when you're, what? Biaset. Small bias set, very, very good. So people, people in pseudorandomness do not use them, but they prefer epsilons, right? Uh, so they, 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 with this, this will be an epsilon not biased. Uh, distribution or set. It might have appeared first in the work of Nawar and Nawar in the early 90s. So this is uh, uh, extremely useful for us, right? Uh, because it's, just, uh, it's fully for here characters like this. And let me just make it uh, more clear. So th th this T is a subset of, uh, of K, right? Uh, and you can either see it as a subset of K, or we can see T as uh, equivalent as uh, some element in this situation to the K, right? Uh, and this character uh, X T of S, in this case, which minus one, is sort of this inner product of S and T. So if this notation is confusing, you, you can think that you have an element here in the group itself, and then you have this inner product. This is the usual character. And somehow this is equivalent to another object. Uh, any, and it is less equivalent, much be a little bit less weak. Uh, what is this other object that this thing is equivalent to? Any guesses? So uh, we gave the hint that Ashmi used this for codes, for binary codes, codes to the GV bound. So what should be the third object that uh, should be equivalent to? That's codes. They are schools. Okay, very good. Oh, yes, I'm special. <laughs> right. And uh, you, you see the translation. I think it's this potential equivalence is a little bit less obvious than the other two. 
So if you have something like this, what this is telling us, right? It's telling us that uh, the characters may behave more or less random, right? Uh, it's as if, the, if the, the bias of some function is only thing that the number of zeros and one is roughly balanced, right? Uh, so one thing that we can do, let's say that the size of S is the same, well, we can form a generating matrix here. Um, is it true? Well, let's say, I think that it's an F2, the n times 10. And uh, what we're going to do, so here you have our S, the same. We can put it in, in the rows, right? Uh, so this is S1, uh, and this is going to be S2, and then so on. And this is going to be the same. Okay. And then here, what we're going to do, we're going to take a T, right? Uh, let's say that now this T is indexing some, some vector here, let's say true to the K. And let's say that T is different than the, the zero vector, right? Uh, and what's happening here is just a bunch of inner products, right? Uh, S1, T, e, et cetera, S2, T. E. Same T. E. And we know that the number of zeros and ones is going to be roughly balanced, right? Uh, because of this condition here on the characters, right? Uh, this average is about the same. So the number of ones and zeros and ones that we see, so the, the hand weight of this guy is going to lie on an interval, I don't know, minus lambda naught, and, and then something like this, one f plus lambda naught, uh, n. So the, the hand weight is going to lie in this interval. For a linear code, it's enough to have a lower bound on the hand weight. So it, it, this is enough to establish minimum distance. But uh, as we pointed out, this, this is the notion of uh, an epsilon balance code. So this, this is the lambda, uh, balance code, or they, they prefer epsilon there, epsilon and balance code. Okay, so we, we, we have something like this, right? Uh, now let's apply uh, operator amplification. Let, let's use the L equals one case of this using this, this matrix here, right? Uh, how would you go about amplifying somehow this guy? So let's say that we start with something that, uh, if you start on a good code, right, that this F here, uh, it, it, it has any guys, and we, I don't know, we have K, and you can find something if the code is good, that's about order K. So K is going to be the rate of the code, this is going to be the block length, and we, we have good codes, right? Codes that have a constant distance, and we can get them to be balanced, when they're not balanced, such that the, the bottom of the number of rows that you have here is at most a constant time. Okay. Right. Uh, now let's apply operator uh, scalar amplification here. And what are the functions that we want to consider? So you can get the, an expander with an interval of in, in the Q. So what's the function? No, no, so, so, so uh, it, it, this is a huge thing, right? Uh, so this is an expander graph and it's true to the K. And you're saying that the degree of these expanders is the same, which is order k. Yeah, so you can get something. Yeah, you can, you, you, if you have a good lambda balance code, you get a, an expander like this. Like a random construction wouldn't. A random construction is amazing. <laughs> it's a DGG bound, but we do not know how to construct explicitly. So since the 50s, people knew uh, random constructions are amazing, but. Uh, we cannot get our hands on them. But it starts to work when to, to, to work when is uh, okay. Yeah, uh, the, 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 the random construction is going to achieve very good trade-offs that are related to, to, to this year. It's going to be better. What they're going to start with some just a good code, a code of constant rate and constant distance. That, that's also lambda not balanced. And, and that, 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 that are easy constructions. If you're not very careful with the trade-off between distance and rate. It's much easier. Well, life becomes much easier when you have explicit construction. When you go close to optimality, random codes are very good, but it, it was very hard to construct them explicitly. Okay, so let, let, let's apply operator amplification here. Uh, um, how could we apply operator amplification? Uh, it's scale amplification, this case. So you, you want to somehow amplify this guy here. Right there. So the functions that we should take, right? Uh, they, they're going to be characters, right? Uh, Non-trivial characters. 
So we are going to apply this for, for all the non-trivial characters, and what we're going to get, right? Uh, the theorem is telling us that, that there is uh, this collection of, of tuples, right? Uh, in S to, to some P, such that uh, when you consider this, the, the expectation you have S1 all the way to ST, you want to this collection of F, S1, F of, of ST. Uh, if, if that function was good, then the assumption in this case is good, right? Uh, uh, or something is telling us that uh, f of s, the original expectation was small. Right? Uh, so we, we have this from the assumption, right? That most lambda naught. Because we started with some Cayley expander, the Cayley expander was related to a lambda naught wise distribution, right? Uh, and uh, we started from this. And the scalar amplification tells us that if you do the amplification using the collection that we got, we are going to have something that is at most lambda, right? It, it amplified the lambda to the desired one. And let's see the blow up, right? What is the new support of this guy? Right? Uh, the, 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 the theorem is going to tell us that W now is going to be order. The lambda not a constant. We can ignore this for this one ends. We have something like this. And then you have lambda squared plus little rule of one. OK? And uh, we, we said that this is uh, because we started from some good code. This is order of, of k, right? Uh, which is the rate of the code. So you get something that uh, it's up to constants looks like k. Uh, so th th this was the Tashman's result that was very important, right? Uh, okay. So we have this. So it's a code of, of distance half. In terms of distance of the code, it's half minus epsilon. And, and the rate that it achieves, so th this is the distance of the code. And the rate that it achieves about that from square. It's a bit smaller because of the zero term, plus zero. So th 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 this was the breakthrough result of talking, right? Uh, achieving this explicitly. Okay. Okay, so now well, let's move. Okay, that's for comparison. Comparison, what would the random do? For? The random will do uh, lambda square. Okay. All right, so uh, we, we played with a billion groups, and a billion groups are very friendly. We have uh, familiar Fourier analysis. Now let's go to general groups, right? Uh, because uh, a lot of the very good expanders, they are over more general non billion groups, right? Uh, and to, to talk about that case, we, we need to understand, uh, uh, we, we need to understand, uh, we need to, to say a few things about representation theory. You're not going to use anything deep about representation theory. Which would be very simple. It's obvious that that uh, kind of construction would give you a matrix that has zeros and ones rather than like when you go back to the normal basis or not. Oh, which matrix do you? Not uh, quite the theorem, but what the, why? Yeah, yeah, that's very good. Uh, a, 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 a character is a multiplicative function, right? Uh, so it's, it's a very good question. So uh, why somehow you get a new generating set, right? Uh, why somehow end up with the same kind of thing? Let's expand this part here, right? Uh, this is just chi of t of s1, etc. chi of t of s uh, t. But the, the character is the representation, the homomorphism. We can combine, you can combine everything inside, right? Uh, so if you have this multiplication here, or, or, or we can simplify this because we have this homomorphism property, this becomes chi t of s1, etc. Plus S D, and uh, yeah, you, yeah, 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 yeah. and the, 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 the new generating set that you you build is something of this. You you got right uh, to 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 write for you have this. Uh, you take the, the product over the group. Or in this case, it's going to be a sum. Uh, S N, then S one. This is the new generating set of of the Cayley graph. This is E. This is the and, and, and then the, the kilograph, the new kilograph that you look at is going to be something like this. Okay, S prime. So it's, it's of the same kind. Okay, so let, let's go to representation here. Uh, and I'm way, way behind that. Yeah, let, let me try to motivate why it may be useful to have a matrix version of this here. And uh, okay, so uh, if you take a general group, not necessarily a billion now, 
very appealing. Uh, we, we need to for, 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 for QM analysis there, the other presentation here, so comes in QM analysis data. QM analysis. That's a little space name, but we are representation theory. Okay. And uh, what we know there, right? Uh, we, we uh, again, we may have some KD graph over now this non abelian group. Here we have a set of generators as well. And uh, I, I did it, it was beautiful in the abelian case that we, we end up with a diagonal matrix that we could read diagonal values on the diagonals and life was very good, right? Uh, now it's no longer the case, life is not as beautiful, but, but uh, the representation theory is going to give us a block diagonalization. There we had the full diagonalization, representation theory give us a block, block diagonalization. of this matrix. And uh, very quickly and somewhat informally, a representation. So uh, definition, uh, representation is just something that captures the direction of the group in a linear way. Uh, so here you're going to have a whole from the group to, to, to the unitary group of some dimension. And uh, it's going to be a homomorphism. So whenever you have two elements of the group, G1, G2, so the, the, this is mapping to the unitary group, right? Uh, so the, the, the inverses are the, the conjugate transpose of this list. And whenever you have two things, you, you get this thing, G1, G2, for all G1, G2. The group. Uh, so this, this is going to be. Yeah, and we are going to work with uh, things over the compass, so life is much nicer here. Uh, a, a, a group has what is called a dual group, which is indexing the, the irreducible representations, very much like a prime is decomposable in terms of prime factors. Uh, the, the, the representations of a group are decomposable in what's called the irreducibles, that is like the, the, the primes. So we have the set of irreducible representations. Uh, representations um, and, uh, and very good. And uh, in the case of the symmetric group, I say they, 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 they correspond to partitions or partitions in of n. We have a very combinatorial way of indexing that they the reduce was there, but you have this big collection of irreducibles. And th there is a now the vertex set of this guy are the elements of G, right? Uh, and, and there is a very natural acting here, right? Uh, there is something that's called the regular representation of the group. We have the regular representation, which it starts of capturing the action of the group in itself, right? Uh, and uh, what the, the regular representation is going to give us is going to be a permutation matrix. So R of G is going to be a permutation matrix over the group to capture the action of G. Not need to, to go into too much details, but this adjacent matrix here, it, it can be written as a, a, an expectation of S going to S of, of this regular representation of S. So it's a, it, when you think about, about the graph on a Kelly graph like this, you will have permutation matrices, right? Uh, so this uh, is the action of the group on, on itself. And we, we sort of know that this guy, the, the Fourier analysis now give us a block, a simultaneous block diagonalization of this, this BC. So uh, it's going to tell us that you have something like this. Uh, what, what's going to happen here? So uh, the three representation is going to occur once. And every other reducible representation that now may be larger dimensional whole is going to occur dimension many times. So here we have uh, the number of copies that this appears is dimension whole. Uh, it's something. So it, this guy is going to be a dimension by dimension whole block. And the number of times that it occurs is like this. And then you're going to have several blocks like this depending on the dimension of the reduced and several times of this. But you will no longer get a beautiful picture that you can just read diagonal values very naively out of the diagonal. You get a block uh, diagonalization like this. So uh, it's going to be some sort of direct sum. So this row is going to be some uh, of just some transformation, it's going to be some direct sum of the irreducible guys. Going to this thing like this. And then the number of times that it appears is dimension whole. And, and then here we have the, the whole. Representation. So it gives us some form of block thing. But this whole is no longer a character, one dimensional thing. 
it's a uh, some larger dimensional beast, right? Uh, so th this is what it gives us, right? Uh, and uh, now what is the motion? So if we have this, it was the adjacent matrix, we can block diagonal line, and you're going to have an average now, right? Uh, so here we have the three representation, it, it's dimensional, it only occurs once, right? Uh, but, but you're going to have other guys here, S belong to S, and then whole S, and, and then so on and so forth, and then several copies of these and so on, and you're going to have those larger blocks living here. Right, uh, and what a, a lambda not expander mean? Right, uh, if you say that this guy is a lambda not expander, it's giving us some bound on the operator norm of the blocks. But let's say that uh, this lambda of this guy backs at most lambda not. Once we have this very nice block diagonal decomposition, it's telling us that for every non trivial reducible representation, so this condition like this is this telling us that the, the, the expectation of S belongs to S of OS. Uh, in terms of operator norm, this is going to get most lambda not for every uh, re representation that's different than the 3 one belonging to the set of the reducibles. So this is the, the condition from before. Before it was just one dimensional characters, now it's larger matrices, right? Uh, but uh, now we, we have a theorem that works, right? Uh, for, for larger dimensional guys. And you can run the same procedure now, right? Uh, so now instead of invoking the theorem with scalar pattern functions, we can take this f to be to be equal to whole, right? Uh, and the same analysis is going to work. So now we take f equal to whole, and then you run this analysis, right? Uh, and you run this analysis, of the operator norm of all the blocks now, they, they are going to, to go from this to, to something much smaller, right? Uh, now we run the amplification, you have this one as uh, B belong to the collection, uh, W of O of S1, uh, SD. And then we know that the operator norm of or the guy that most lambda. So you transform this guy into a lambda not expander into a lambda expander. And uh, the, the, the whole point of representation theory is just to say that you need to, to play with larger matrices, right? If you want to do amplification for more general KD graphs and so on. Okay. But it, it, and notice that this amplification is going to be very, if the construction of W is very efficient, this amplification is very efficient as well. Right? Uh, but uh, we, we promise a theorem for general graphs. Right? Uh, and how can you obtain for general graphs out of this? Um, we can try to reduce this, this theorem here. Does the huh? Tashma result that if you expand them for uh, it, 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 similar it, it, things if you start with the correct? Underlying expander. If you want to work with, I don't know, more general, the Tashman's results is going to work on abelian groups. And abelian groups, the degree is going to be at least logarithmic in the size of the group. So if you want to get a bounded family of expanders, you may need to play with non abelian groups. And then there you really need matrices. So the, the Tashman's result is a scalar case. For codes, rather than. Yeah, for, for codes, it's beautiful, right? And for, for DRGs, for it, it's very interesting. The, the, the scalar case already extremely interesting. Yeah, but if you want k graphs, almost from illusion k graphs, you might need to take this route because the blocks now are matrices. Okay, and how can you get this for a general graph? Right? Uh, any ideas what uh, we can do for it? And the, the transformation for general graphs may not be as efficient. Do, do you know how to reduce the, the, the general graph case to the k graph case or almost the k graph case? So I know the property that you're preserving, like in the Kelly graph, it's clear because uh -huh. it's the Kelly graph. So yeah. uh, oh, you see that it's preserving the, the Kelly structure, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, uh -huh. And but, but what, what happened for the graph? Like, yeah, what, what property is preserving? Uh, right? It's a simple reduction from, from, from the Kelly graph, and you're going to explore it. It's not a But it, it, it can be way more expensive, right? Uh, if here, if you start with something that's strongly explicit, that's very local, you end up with something that's strongly explicit. Really something needs to change because you could have started with a KD graph of a Boolean group and your result is giving you something that should match up with the KD graph of a non abelian group. Uh -huh. But it, it, it's, it's a very simple uh, reduction, right? Uh, so th 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 there is this fact here. Uh -huh. Okay. We're going to use this uh, theorem of the 
since it works in with the conditions. Well, you, uh, then I'm going to associate things with permutations. You're going the right direction. Uh, permutations on any vertices and the agents of the, the, the general things that are going to be, going to be the propositions. You're very good. It, 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 it may be more general permutations, but it's going to be permutations. You're in the right direction. Right? Uh, they're very good. So it, 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 if you have a D regular, let, let's say that uh, you have X, that it's a D not regular uh, graph. What? It's the exact thing good that you're going to do. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. Okay. No, but it's right. It's adjacent to me to try the X. It's a, an average of, of, of uh, one over D of permutation matrices. The I are our permutation matrices. If you have a regular graph, so the I's are. Find the, the composition. Take, it takes polynomial time. So if, if you have something that was strongly explicit, most likely you do not want to go through the job. But uh, you, you have this fact. And once you have this permutation matrix, right, you can bring it up to you. Uh, as you're saying, right, the permutation matrix, PI, yeah, it's a matrix of exactly one, zero, and one, and parallel and column. You can associate these with if some SI belongs to the symmetric group of, of the words, right? Uh, C, D, right? Uh, and uh, if you look at the composition of these, this is uh, you can remove the, the top eigen space, the one direction, right? Uh, the permutation matrix, we also know it's the composition, right? Uh, it's a very special kind of action here. So you know that uh, under appropriate diagonalization, this is going to look like something like this. And the whole standard representation of the symmetric group, PI is going to be something like this. Right? Uh, there's a big block here. You have the trivial, and then you have the standard. Representation and these are simple guys. The lambda standard, the average of these over the generating set is small, it's lambda not. And then both you amplify and then you get the result. But you went through, through this translation, right? Okay. So if you have a D regular graph, you can write its adjacent matrix as an average of permutation matrices. Each permutation matrix you, you, you can see it corresponding to an element that's permuting the, 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 the words of this graph. Right, uh, and this permutation matrix, it, it can be appropriately diagonalized. In, this is sort of the all ones, like in space and the, everything else. And this thing has a name, it's a standard representation. So the, this is the sort of the defining representation of the symmetric group, which decomposes into three door representation and, and this other one. But it's- uh, As a sanity check, how does this thing look like if I start with a, with a graph of a helical? Like if we were Kelly guy. In the Kelly graph, this is over Q, right? In the Kelly graph, you can already use the regular. Yeah, I know, but I'm still asking what, what exactly is the decomposition to permutations, and would this still it, 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 the same thing? It, it, it's going to factor in, in, in that way. So that, 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 oh. that, that would be the more appropriate way of, of, of looking at it. Uh, yeah, but hmm? you can twist the question a little bit. You start with the Kelly graph of the Indian group, which is pretty bad. And but they should still be able to do this. Oh no! So so the, it, 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 if you start with something, yeah, if the degree that you start with is large, you are not. Oh, you always pay the initial degree of probably is already better. So you see, it, it, it's going. To, yeah. So the, you cannot make an addition. No, 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 so uh, okay, we, we have these for four general theorems. It's just saying that you, for right permutation matrix, you can see it as a group element. And uh, we know that this, this kind of decomposes in the, the all ones direction and the complement. And this thing happens to be a representation. And then you can match in the previous uh, picture. Thank you. What, what are the vertices and the edges of the new graph? Um, the, the vertex set is the same. The, the, the new edges are, are going to be products. Uh, it's it's products of the same tree. Yeah. So the representation is immune. Get a new generator set from the table. Uh, yeah, so it's the same thing. Same. The same. Exactly. So you have something like this. It's a homomorphism, right? Uh, this is W. You, you can rewrite this as a uh, user homomorphism property and inch by inside, right? Uh, see? Uh, and then uh, the, the new generating set is going to be the, the product, right? Uh, so you're going to have a new generating set that's just the product. 
Now I am zero intuition about what properties of the original block of Brazil. We, we, we are not creating any new connection, right? Uh, that, that was not there in the graph, right? Uh, okay, that's awesome. So, uh, yeah, the connections now correspond to you're taking, that, right? you're, you're taking short products of the, the permutations that were there initially. It is as if you were doing a, a small, a small like random walk with some preview. It's not. It's not a very short part in the original. Yeah. It's sort of like every direction somehow has a label associated with the same. Okay. Okay. But it's this black box, there's a set. And they're saying, well, anytime you take one of these T, T length walks, it's going to be an edge of the piece. But it's given to you by that theorem, which I don't know is the structure of the W. Other thing. Okay, so let, let's try to, uh, to, to, to play with computation. And we, you guys already hinted that some collections of tuples that might amplify for a straight uh, And let, let's try to, to think about collections that, that, that can amplify, right? Uh, and let, let's try some uh, simple approach first. The, the, the first thing that might come to mind is to take the full product, right? Uh, and when you take the full product, right, uh, if you start with something that was good on average, and let's go back first to this to, to, to the scalar case. We'll do that most likely not. Right? And if you take the full product and then you take the expectation, this one, et cetera, C belonging to W of F of S1 of F plus C. Okay, you want to understand this? This is a full product set, right? So this, this becomes just equal to this part of the, 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 the T, right? Uh, F of S, let's go on to S, uh, to, 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 to the T, and then we, we get something that's named the, at most lambda not uh, to the T. And uh, if you take P equals to log uh, lambda not lambda, we, we get a desired amplification. But, but, but now the size of this beast is too large, right? And we already did that. that the, if you look at this, this is going to be the size of S. And then this uh, log, this log term here. So in, in the particular case of Tashma, if you lose, if it's not linear in the original set, you leave the, you start with some good code, then you get something worse than a good code. It stops being a good code. So this is a very bad dependence, uh, the this for amplification. So you do not want to do this. Uh, we, if you start with a good code in the example of Tashma, you, you lose that, okay? And uh, uh, the nice thing to do is, okay, it goes to this. Let, let's subsample, right? Uh, and uh, uh, we can choose a W containing S to the T, uh, you write trend, right? Uh, selecting couples, uh, but let's say you form a, a trend. And if you, if you take a collection W, Let's say that the, the size of S here is N. And the, if you take a collection W that's about N divided by lambda squared, we, we can use a term of bound and a union bound to say that uh, whenever you start with this condition here, uh, this condition here, we are going to obtain uh, under this collection of tuples, uh, we are going to obtain a uh, good amplification. Matrix. It's a matrix. Okay. There is a matrix bound. Okay. So we, we obtain this with high probability. The, the number of functions that we have here is true to the, the size of S, which is about true to the N. And if you want to somehow preserve this, this kind of bias, right? I mean, if you do the full amplification, the full collection, we, we will get bias. This will be lambda, right? Um, and uh, it, but if you take a random subset like this, you get the amount of concentration that the, the union bound goes through, and you, you get this amplification for every function. But we have few functions here. Uh, <laughs> very good, right? Uh, no, the question it means that like for the symmetric group, you can construct like a uh, much better thing if you allow random construction inside because. Yeah, fortunately, no. Uh, yeah, so we, we can try to run this picture. 
about a factor on this picture uh, for the matrix valid case. So we, we have a matrix that's given by an average of all the matrices and the operator norms at most is much, right? Uh, and then uh, we do the collection. Uh, it's going to be matrix um, power, right? Uh, so it behaves nicely with the operator norm, becomes this, you amplify. But you lost in terms of too expensive, right? Uh, if I started from an expander that has some uh, degree denote and some expansion of the north, as you take powers, you do not improve the trade-off, right? The, the expansion improves, but the degree also improves. But the trade-off between degree and expansion does not improve during this, in the matrix case. So this, this is uh, not ideal. Yeah, but now let's revisit this picture here. And naive version of matrix turn off bound depend on the dimension. So it, 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 the, the worst case there, it, it's sort of diagonal matrices, and you pay a factor that depends on the dimension. So L, the dimension that did not appear anywhere before, was going to appear here, and you cannot get it. Uh, so you, it, it, life would be very good, right? If you would have very good generator for a bunch of groups, right? If, if, if it's some suitable version of, of making sure that was, 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 was known, right? Uh, like this. Uh, but, but unfortunately, uh, in the scalar case, the dimension is one, but if you go to larger cases, you have diagonal matrices, right? Okay, I think I have a bunch of, of sum of matrices that are diagonal, and then you somehow need to run union bound to control all, all the entries. So you, it, there is some dependence on the dimension. You should try to do this for, for operators. So this strategy is, is very good for scalars. It, it, it's not a good strategy for, for operators. For, for, for matrices, naively it breaks, breaks down. It doesn't work. All right, so we have some two, and, and Tashman's result can be seen as sort of a deronomization of this guy, right? Uh, but, but here we, we have some explicit amplification that we do not know the written analog. Arguably, it should be, there could be one, but we need to be careful, right? Uh, if, if there is a deterministic one, there is some distribution, but potentially might be very tricky. Right? But, uh, yeah, you, you can naive version of turn off bound those factors and dimension, and the uh, two new values. Okay. Uh, now, better collections of W. We, we have a talk about expander graphs, right? Uh, how could we choose W? <laughs> so, we want to amplify expanders using expanders, right? Mm -hmm. The analysis the, 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 the is going to resemble a lot the exact product. But it, 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 yeah, so we, let, let's start simple. So there are two the, the, the randomizations are two, two sparse solutions. So, so, so solution one, would be to take W. Uh, here you're going to have an auxiliary expander graph. So X is going to be an expander graph on the vertex set S. And th th that's why you're going to associate the, the S that's appeared there with vertices of this expander. Um, so auxiliary. Uh, expander. And uh, this W is going to be the, the collection of, of Fox on this. Uh, so collection of blocks uh, of size length minus one, well, let's say size t, on this auxiliary expander on x. So this is going to be one solution. If you take the, but you need to prove that this kind of thing works, right? Uh, so th this is the first solution, and that, that, that already is quite good. You can achieve amplification lambda with something that, uh, if the support size, W that's uh, order lambda naught, a size of S, a lambda to the four. We are off from the off, off, optional parameters. We are quadratically off from optional parameters here. So this will give us something like this. We are quadratically off. But this is used in, in the more refined solution. Right? Uh, so this is solution one. So G is uh, X is an arbitrary oxidant expander. That, that, that's going to be close from illusion because we want better parameters, but uh, it's sort of a generic expander. And th the solution two is going to use a high order zigzag product to derive my solution one. Solution two is going to use uh, this high order zigzag product of uh, Benaroy and Tashman. Zigzag, and uh, this is a uh, Benaroy and Tashman from 2008, and to, 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 to the randomize this. So, so now the, the final W is going to be, I don't know, some sort of double prime, which is going to be a sub collection of blocks. 
it, it randomizes the, the it randomizes this guy here using some high order version of zigzag. And then now the parameters are good. You achieve know, lambda with the correct about the correct size. So this is what Ashman did in the scalar case, and uh, we are going to do the same, right? Uh, we need to show that. Uh, so our proof, in a certain sense, is going to be a very natural generalization of attachment and evidence to from scalars to matrices. And surprise me, it, it, it works. Uh, okay, so this is the, the first solution, and this is the second solution. Let's focus on this one. This is very to achieve. This construction here is a beautiful construction, but it takes longer, right? It's a higher order version of this exact uh, construction. But let's see how, how far we can go. But let, 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 let's see this one right in action. And uh, I'm running short on time here, but uh, the, the exercise that I have managed to do is I will, I will prove the scalar version for you, and you will prove the matrix version for me. But let, let's see how. Oh, that's because it's a simple proof, right? Uh, uh, but but let, let, let's see how, how far we can go, right? Uh, okay. So now we let's say that we are, we are back in this other case. Plus minus one, uh, very intuitive, right? Uh, uh, we, we we start with this assumption that this f has small bias, right? Meaning that the, the expectation over this multiset of f of s is, is at most some lambda naught. And uh, you really would like to understand what, what, what happens, right? Uh, with this w, with w of solution one. W of solution one, so sharp rocks and expander. So now we would like to understand what automatic implies. For this guy here, S1, ST, F of S1, uh, F of ST. So, uh, what can you show here? Okay. And the, let's go for it. And uh, he was asking how long to think about S, how it's associated. So, here we, we, we have this auxiliary expander graph. You have x that we it's a um, mass e right uh, it's going to be some uh, expander graph for us and uh, we have the vertices right uh, of this expander graph and here you can see that the values of the function are sitting on the vertices right uh, so here we have i don't know this is s1 and here we, we think we're associated with f of s1 right uh, well let's say that this happens to be a plus one and then this is s2 and then this becomes f of s2 and let's say that this is a minus one and so on, right? So we associate that the vertices with, with the values of the function. And you get something like this, right? And this is, they are sitting on the vertices of our expander and we are going to take short walks now. Right? And so the, the collection algorithm is it's taking short walks on, on this kind of thing and multiplying the values along the short walks, right? Uh, they take, take short walks like this and, and multiply the values along the short walks. This gives us, uh, this kind of amplification, and you need to understand this uh, this big sphere. <laughs> we, we set up that our set of expanders in terms of our spectrum the expanders, right? Uh, so if you're looking at an expression like this, we should somehow try to relate this in a spectral way, right? Uh, can, can, can you write this in terms of matrices somehow, right? And use spectral properties. That, that's what, what we're going to shoot for. And uh, let's let's start slowly. Let's sit, let's consider the case that t is equal to two. When t is equal to two, we are just looking at the edges of this, right? Uh, so uh, let's say that the uh, special case that t is equal to two, and in this case, w happens to be just the edges, right? Uh, and uh, what, what's going to happen? Uh, it, it's going to be very convenient to define some some diagonal matrix that encodes uh, um, f. So you are going to define a matrix pi associated with f. That's going to be a matrix in R s cross R s, and uh, so it's going to be a diagonal matrix. And uh, this matrix is going to have the values here. So pi of f is going to be f of s one 
f of s true in the lab. But let's say that f lives on inverted square. So f of the same. So zero like this. We have a matrix like this. And you would like to express this quantity here in a more algebraic way. So this you have s1 s true. Going to W, and then he have F of S1, S2. S2. Right, I would like to understand this guy. Can you write this simple guy in matrix form? Somehow. And uh, let, let, let's try that. Let's read it. That is here. And uh, how can we, we start writing this guy in matrix form? We, we can uh, sum over everything, right? Uh, the, the number of edges in here, they, they are sort of directed. Uh, this guy is going to have some degree, but, but, but let's say the degree of this guy is C, that has some uh, degree little d. We have the summation of S1, S2, you don't trans of F, S1, um, and F, S2, and then the indicator, right, that the S1 forms an edge. We have, we have something like this. And this looks like a lot of a quadratic form, right? Uh, if you see F as a vector, right? Uh, what is this, right? We can gobble up the normalization here, the one over D, we put it here. And then uh, what, what we have, we have something like this one over N. And then you're seeing F as a vector now, dagger. We have the normalized adjacent matrix of X. We put this D inside to get the normalized adjacent matrix, and we have this. Okay, very good. Another thing that we can do, we can replace the, the occurrence of this f with uh, here we replace the all ones vector, and then you put a pi f here, pi f, a x, and pi f, uh, all, all ones here. Okay, you can can we write in this way as well? So this is the all ones, all ones. and now we are going to redistribute the, this uh, n in square root of n here, square root of n there, because we want to make this unit vectors. Okay, so uh, square root of n, now they are unit vectors for us. Very good. So if you want to give a bound on this, it's enough to give a bound on the operator norm of this matrix, right? It's sandwiched by two units vectors, right? So uh, if you want to bound, now putting these things together, if you want to bound this thing, expectation of S1, as to belong to W of F as well as F of S2. This is going to be at most the, the operator norm of this pi F, dx pi F of operator norm. Right? There's some which in this matrix with two unit vectors. So if you manage to bound this, you're good to go. Okay? And uh, this simple proof generalizes for larger values of the turn out the way. So we have another expression for this. And uh, what can be shown is that if you have now larger walks, and this one, uh, all the way to sub ST, from to W, set of S1, it's going to admit a similar uh, operator expression like this. But now, um, um, you're going to have some repetitions. So we have pi f, and then you have pi x, p minus one, this property, p minus one operator norm. So when you generalize to walks of size p, you, you get an, an expression like this. An easy uh, exercise to do, to do it. And now let's analyze this, this, this right? Uh, and what is the philosophy of zigzag? In the zigzag, you analyze two steps, and see what's the operator you can make that. It, it may be tricky to analyze these, these steps, that there might be too long, but the, the operator norm is multiplicative, right? Uh, so you can always de 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 decompose this morally, but, but that may not be very precise. Just do something like this, uh, AX by F, you can see two steps of this, AX by F. O o operator norm, and, and this is going to be P divided by two morally. So I'm combining, I'm going to look at two steps. The operator norm is multiplicative, right? Uh, so we have about P steps here, and they are combining, and they're going to focus on two steps. 
Very good. Okay, so uh, you want to analyze that. If you have a good bound on this AX by, by F, uh, AX by F, we, we are going to be happy. And uh, now comes the condition that this is, this matrix has plus minus one on the diagonal. So you can ignore this from the greater norm. And uh, it, it's enough to bound something like this AX by F, AX, greater norm. And, and, and now ideas very similar to zigzag would appear, right? Uh, this resembles a lot of zigzag uh, at a synthetic level. Uh, and we'll let, let's see how it analyze. And in the zigzag, it's convenient to decompose the space into a, a parallel space and an orthogonal space. So this, uh, okay, so, uh, you're going to have we are going to have some space that's called the parallel space, which is going to be the span of the all ones. This is a all ones vector in R to the S. Okay, and, and, and then you look at this orthogonal complement so, 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 such that uh, the original space R S can be written as orthogonal direct sum of these three spaces. We, we have something like this, right? Uh, and if you want to understand the operator norm of this guy, we need to understand how it brings uh, an arbitrary unit vector, right? Uh, so we, we take the arbitrary unit vector in this space, in this RS, uh, it, it can be decomposed as a uh, perpendicular part plus some parallel parts, right? And according to, to those two spaces, and uh, we, we see what happens, right? Uh, so what, what happens with the, the norm of this? So pi f, dx, uh, v, and then we use triangular inequality. The, the, the orthogonal part, it's very good, right? I mean, so the perpendicular part, when it interacts with the matrix A, so this is the part, we are going to have a decay of, of lambda of this expander, right? I mean, let's do it slowly. dx, pi f, AX. And then you can even take the problem that then ends. It's going to be quite simple. So here, the, you can ignore this part, right? This has operator norm at most one, it has operator norm at most one. So it disappears, right? Uh, and when AX interacts with something that's perpendicular to the ones, it shrinks, right? Uh, so this guy can be bounded by at most the, the spectral expansion of X, right? Uh, so now we see the spectral expansion of the oxidative graph emerging here, right? Uh, uh, now we have an expander and you have something that's a constant times the old ones. An expander does nothing to this, right? This guy's in the top eigenspace. So it's as if when we hit here, it, 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 what you have here is still something that uh, it's AX, pi F, uh, V, we can ship it. We did nothing to treat. But now we have this vector. Yeah, uh, yeah, they start, I think. <laughs> it, it, they, they, they start, exactly. They, they, they start spinning because otherwise you cannot discard this guy. They, they could blow up. If you can analyze without the stars, you could potentially the, the randomized probabilistic log space. So it's very, very extremely interesting, but, but yeah. Uh, okay, so we, we have something like this, and uh, whatever this is, this is a vector, right? Uh, and you can decompose it further, right? Uh, so the, the, when AX interacted with this, it, it became, it, this part became V parallel, did not treat, so we have this, and you can decompose this vector further into parallel and orthogonal. So this thing here comes a x by f of v parallel uh, orthogonal, and in the orthogonal part we are very happy, right? Uh, so a x is hitting this guy with lambda. Notice that the norm of this guy is only shrinking, right? Uh, so we get a lambda like this, but we also get a term that's the parallel of this, right? Uh, 
So you also need to understand, uh, and here this has operator norm, so we can write something like this, phi f d works. So we want to understand the, 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 the component of this guy that's in the parallel direction. Right? Uh, so we'll, let's try to do that. So uh, the claim here, uh, uh, what is the bound that we'd like to, to see here? So we are applying this to a parallel vector and you want to see its parallel component. We want to give some bound here and let's see what, what would be the proof. This is a true one. So phi f e one. This is going to be the most of the, the, the soup of some, we can take some w, I'm going to the V of a unit norm, two of a unit norm, of a, this u, phi f, the, uh, uh, so you're going to have some sort of sandwiching like, like this, right? Uh, but this space, this, this guy is just uh, plus minus one or one normalized. This, this guy is just plus minus one with some constants, right? Uh, so the, it could be the case that it's norm decreased. It has norms at most one. So you can, can treat any bound. So those two guys are Taylor at the time the ones, right? Uh, you can treat any bound this by at most one over the the whole one's vector, and then your sandwich with the pi f. So here you have a transpose, and then here you have a whole one's square root of n. Okay, and this is the diagonal matrix. So the, the effect that, that that's going to, to, to have is that uh, you're taking the average of the diagonal matrix. So this is square root of n combined with the square root of n, and the only you see a sum of the diagonal matrix divided by one over n. So this thing here. Is going to be the average, right? Uh, the absolute value of the average of s, going to s, of f of s. And this we know by assumption that uh, we assume this should be at most lambda naught. This is most and lambda naught. Right? So, do we to conclude? Right? So this is the diagonal matrix encoding F. When you have this kind of sandwiching, we, we see the bias of the function that's at most lambda naught. So from this plane, we get this at most lambda naught. And then we go back here. We just prove that this is at most lambda naught. Okay, so the, the, this whole bound here, what, what we have just shown is that uh, this whole bound here is at most uh, two lambda x plus some lambda naught. You get something like this, and you typically think that this lambda x is about lambda naught, so you have lambda naught, more. Uh, so if you go back here, we, you're going to have something. This for us is going to be more. So we typically take this lambda x to be more lambda naught, and uh, we are going to have a decay that's more the uh, lambda naught to the p over two. It's a more of decay. So you get a decay one out of two steps. And this is the source of one of the quadratic losses. One quadratic loss is going to come later because this is going to be Ramanujan, so the expansion of the degree is going to be quadratically off, but this is unavoidable. And one, another quadratic loss is this. And this leads you to, uh, to the four instead of a square bound. Okay, now you have matrices, right? Uh, now let's re repeat this strategy, right? Uh, and then uh, you can tell me how to do it. It's going to be very uh, so now we no longer have these, right? Uh, we have matrix value functions. So as you pointed out, uh, we want the operator norm of each individual guy to be at most one. So, so, so that some of the things that we did there are okay. And then we have this assumption now in terms of, of the operator norm. We have the assumptions here, like conclude something in terms of the operator norm. Now, now we have the larger dimensional matrices, right? Uh, so instead of having just plus minus one from the four, we have big matrices sitting on the vertical of this graph. Like this, something like a two by two, one, one, one minus one, one potentially one over square root of two or, or something like this. Right, uh, now we have larger matrices sitting on the vertices on the vertical of this graph. 
okay, how we generalize the proof? And uh, the, the hint is that uh, the simple generalization of this proof. Um, so you, is it clear that the scalar case? It's uh, easy analysis. So this matrix was a fully diagonal matrix, right? Uh, now the matrix F, <laughs> it's matrix value, right? Uh, so the expected matrix should be a block diagonal matrix, right? Uh, so we, now they're working with uh, matrix value function. So this guy should be something that block diagonal, right? Uh, so, what? It's horrible, but, but now the Fs are blocks. <laughs> now you can put something like this. Right? The Fs became blocks, right? Uh, and, and, and now it lives in something like this. The L times size of S should L. Something like this. Right? Uh, very good. Uh, this, uh, we even need to inter interpret strings in terms of operator norms, right? Um, and then we also need to make sense of the graph, right? Uh, what is the structure of the graph that would allow us to do this amplification, right? Potentially need to change the, the way that we represent the graph. And the good point to start, right? Uh, it's always t, t, t equals to two and the f, right? Uh, that, that's an easy case to, 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 to start. Okay, so we were expanding this. And last time we, we said, okay, we have these two things, it's equal to this, but now we should be a little bit more careful, right? Uh, and let's write things in a way that uh, things become more clear. So let's rewrite this part here in this form. We have this f of s1. So here uh, we are going to have the indicator of this thing being an edge. So uh, s1, uh, s2 being an edge. Tensored, uh, tensored with an identity matrix an L by L identity matrix. And here on the other side, we are going to have an FS2. So if you do this tensoring like this, these guys are right there, they're going to multiply this, this all once. And uh, you're going to have a very natural expression below. So a, a, a good way of, of thinking about this is that uh, we, we have the adjacent matrix of our graph, right? Uh, so X, we had some AX, some adjacent matrix of the graph. And uh, it, it had ones in some places, right? Uh, I don't know, zero, one, one, zero, one. It's some adjacent matrix. And, and, and now it's as if we became really tiny and you're looking at this, uh, this, the adjacent matrix. There are some tiny beings looking at this adjacent matrix. And now these ones, they, they're going to become larger identity matrices, right? Uh, so you're going to move from something that might resemble like this to have some larger identities in the box, larger identities in the box. So larger identities and so on. So now you are this tiny being that for us, a one became a larger uh, identity matrix, right? Uh, so we have this tensor form. So the way of writing this is uh, more precisely would be, it's the adjacent matrix A tensored with the ones with the identity of dimension L. So you are going to have something like this, right? Uh, and, and then you're going to sandwich. So we are going to sandwich with, with this pi operator that, that we have. Let, let, let's cut some step here. This is going to be a pi operator. Pi operator, red including the pi operator. Pi operator, so we're going to have something like this. And uh, we, we, we need to be more careful now, so the space is a bit larger. So we have this pi operator, but we, we have more stuff. So here we have the all ones in, in the first component, and then you have some identity matrix on this other part. So uh, the transpose of this, and then here we, we have a similar thing. We have the all ones here, uh, tensored with the identity matrix. Yeah. And uh, this is going to be a matrix, right? Uh, and uh, if you want to understand the operator norm of this guy, at some point you're going to sandwich it with vectors, right, on both sides. And this is the, the, the representation that we have for this. So when you sandwich this with vectors on this subsystem here, they're computing the sandwich of this guy with vectors, right? So you're, you're trying to understand the operator norm of whatever is inside. So again, you're also trying to understand the operator norms. And uh, it's, it's, it's not hard to believe that things are going to generalize uh, nicely here, right? Uh, so here, instead of having something like this, we can answer with the identity L, pi F, 
uh, TDD is inside, T minus one. Okay, and, and then you, you can split it. You can break it like this. Like this. So it's going to be the, the, the same kind of trade off. Right, uh, so this is TX, answer I am. Now the other ones became identity matrix, big identity matrices. Uh, so this is Squared. This is a that's an identity. Yeah. This is by F. And you would like to understand this the operating order of this thing, T over two. Okay, so the generalization is extremely natural, right? It's uh, but now let's go back and do this little base space that we can before. Right? Uh, Okay, so now we are not decomposing this space only, so, right? Uh, we are decomposing something slightly bigger, right? Uh, we are decomposing RS tensor with C to the L, right? Uh, we are decomposing a slightly larger space. And what is going to be the notion of uh, 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 a, a parallel for us? The notion of parallel for us is going to be a guy that's all ones in the first system, in the part of the graph X, tensor with some arbitrary vector. This is an arbitrary factor in this space, and then um, this belongs to this tensor space here. CL. Okay, and, and, and then we have natural motion of the product, and then the product can look at uh, the, the orthogonal uh, space, and this gives us the composition of this space into some parallel and some perpendicular part of, of this larger space now. And uh, we, we can run this analysis, right? Uh, let's use a convenient notation to not have to rewrite everything. Let's say that the x, uh, the, the, let's say that this guy with this uh, long block is, is the, the tensor version of phi L. And our phi is a block matrix now, so we can put some tables like this, right? Uh, tables like this is the tensor decay entity, right? Uh, and, and then you can start running this analysis again, right? We have something of this form, right? Uh, now, whenever this guy hits a, a perpendicular vector, right? Uh, it's uh, it's going to shrink as well. So it, it hits a perpendicular vector, you, you get a decay of lambda x in the same way, okay? And then yeah. uh, here, this guy here, we have a parallel guy, right? Uh, a parallel guy. Now it's a larger guy, but what is this halo version of the x? It's the original graph times identity. So uh, the graph does not fit this part of the tensor. Identity does not fit to this guy. So this this guy, this becomes just the uh, parallel, right? Uh, here, uh, we, need, we need to do the same thing. We need to decompose this guy into a perpendicular and a parallel part, right? Uh, the perpendicular gets killed by lambda, another lambda. And this guy here, right? We need to analyze this guy and see what, what it gives in this case, right? Uh, Okay, so uh, we, we have the claim. We want you to understand the projection, but, but now that we do not have, a, the, the space is no longer one dimension. It's a larger dimension space. So we are trying to find the soup. So now this V, uh, this guy like this, is of the form all, all ones tensored with some vector B, right, and C to the L, right? And so this B belongs to C to the L, right? Um, and this guy has norm at most one, right? Um, so what you're going to have here, uh, it's going to be something like this, you're trying to find a U, but a, a, a unit vector U can, can be expressed in a different way. So this guy, uh, we have this, and we, we can write it as, um, as a guy in this space. A guy in this space is going to look like it's something, I don't know, A, belonging to C to the L, and A of norm one. And then here, you are going to have one, Start of n, answer a. Uh, this is a uh, transpose. Then you have, we are going to have our pi f. And then here we are going to have uh, all ones uh, divided by the square root of n. And then here, the answer with this b, we are only replacing this b parallel with this. Then we have something like this. So we are, we are going to have a sandwich of this pi operator again. But this guy, what, what this guy is doing, right? It's placing many copies. You are sandwiching this guy 
with many copies of the vector A here and many copies of the vector B here. So the, the, the same kind of sandwiching is going to happen, right? Uh, so what you're doing is some sort of, uh, you're going to have a vector that has a bunch of A's here and a vector that has a bunch of B's here. So it's a similar sandwiching uh, before. And what we have is that uh, you're looking at the soup of, of this guy. So this is the same. And then uh, this is going to be A dagger expectation of S belonging to our set S of now our matrix, matrix value functions blah. Some which then we have this, some which B on one side and A on the other side. We have something like this. And this is bounded by the operator norm, right? When there's some which in the vectors like this, this is a vector of L because no. it has the copy of the no. no. Vector of L. Okay, so this, this, oh, I see. Because uh, this, this one L over F. Okay, yeah, yeah. So yeah. this, this one over yeah. combines, and you're going to sum, but this is a larger guy. The, the, the L is inside the X. The L is inside. Yeah. So this is a big guy. Before it was a theater, now it's an L by L matrix. And the, the operator normal allows to be one dimensional in some sense, right? Uh, and this becomes at most, what, what I assume from this guy, this becomes at most like the norm. Okay. And then I, you just show that, that exactly the same behavior uh, happened. And this was completely dimension independent already, right? Uh, already in this, this, this simple case, it, it's weird, right? Uh, uh, expander rocks are so powerful that you can get uh, things that are highly, uh, that are dimension independent. Okay. Qu questions so far about this? This is the base amplification. And th th this is very similar to zigzag. Uh, to, to, to describe the full version of, of, of this thing, what you need to do, you, you need to do like Tashma. Tashma uses this high order zigzag to de randomize this construction. So you need to, to show that somehow uh, using this high order zigzag, you can also de randomize things for matrices. And uh, the proof also goes through uh, in that case. Um, unfortunately, I don't think that we're going to have time to, to discuss that uh, a lot. But if you're familiar with zigzag, this is some form of the true analysis that we have seen some form of manifestation of zigzag, right? Uh, and um, potentially, with a lot of extra time, I will show the proof of the zigzag and then move towards showing how the high order comes about. But I don't think it, this is possible. So let me try to wrap up. Uh -huh. Okay, maybe something that this uh, guy would be very happy for. Okay. Something about. Mm -hmm is how do you use this? I mean, what do you get from these things that start from specific graphs <laughs> other than general good expanders? Oh, 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 very good. So they are giving an excuse to, to go to, to, to some applications. Let's go to some applications. How do you use this theorem? Right? What, what is the, the advantage of this? Right? Uh, okay. Well, let's quickly discuss some applications. So uh, in, in group theory, right, we have seen that abelian groups, they, they cannot give boundary degree expander graphs, right? The degree needs to be logarithmic, right? Uh, but, but if you take a non-abelian group, you might have hope of having boundary degree expanders, right? Uh, one very important group is the symmetric group, right? Uh, uh, the, the symmetric group on many letters, right? The same, the, the, the symmetric group. This is a very important group, right? Uh, and uh, for a long time, people knew some, some generating sets, but, but uh, they knew that the, that the diameter was polylog. So it was not an, an expanding generator set, right? Uh, and for a long time, people weren't sure if the symmetric group would admit bound degree expander famous, right? Uh, and uh, in around two, two, 2005 or 2004, Passabot found the first explicit construction, right? Uh, I don't know, around 2005, he found some, some generating set of constant size, and if everything needs to be set for famous, but well, let's keep things simple. So this is our order of one, so, 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 such that k, as in uh, s, we have this graph, the length of this guy is at most some lambda not bounded away from one. It's at most a constant. But so he, he, it was hiding in on three, he gave a construction, and uh, when you give a construction like this, th th there is, it's not necessary that it's going to give something that's almost optimal. So uh, th th this construction is going to have some degree and some constant expansion, constant degree, constant expansion. 
but very far from Ramanujan well. Now we have we know how to amplify calligraphs in a way that preserves the structure of calligraphs. Right there. So let's apply our, our amplification. This operator amplification, we apply operator amplification. Well, what we're going to get is shielding the same symmetric group. We found a new set of generating sets, right? Uh, so such that uh, this lambda parameter is going to get most lambda. And the degree of this graph, of this new graph, is going to be order of uh, one over lambda squared plus zero. So it's going to give us almost from a motion. So one thing that was not obvious in the serial graphs, we have very different groups, right? Uh, would all groups be equally good in terms of expansion? Right? Uh, so you might expect that some groups might be worse. And the, this machinery is proven in a very generic way that whenever someone proves that the group is expanding, it's almost optimally expanding as well for all groups, right? Uh, so for, for all uh, finite non abelian groups, uh, we, we, we know generators. For one of them, we do not know explicit. But uh, it would imply this, right? Uh, and whenever you have an application, right? That uh, I don't know, you have some expander, and and the, the, the degree sort of the resource if you're taking random walks is how much you pay in terms of randomness at each step, and the, the, the spectral gap is sort of capturing how much how fast you're converging through the uniform measure. So you're doing a randomness efficient way. And some applications, it's interesting to look at your expander graph rather than some I don't know random illusion graph. So the, the symmetric group has a lot of applications. Uh, so, for instance, people have some notion that's called quantum expander, uh, which potentially I may give you some overdose of, of expander graphs today. But uh, uh, now that we, we, with this amplification, we have almost Ramanujan expanders for, for the symmetric group, we got the first explicit construction of quantum expanders, uh, which potentially, and quantum expanders are useful to understand entanglement. So, you have Alice and Bob, they, they share the maximally entangled state, follow if that makes sense or not. And it's sort of a super operator that acts on dense matrices that, that, that somehow it, 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 in, in the maximally mixed state, it, it's a fixed point, it's like the all-ones vector. And everything that's orthogonal to it in the Frobenius inner product, it shrinks. And it allows people to, to, to detect entanglement across Bob, Alice and Bob in a way that's dimension independent. So that if Alice has part of a maximally entangled state and Bob has all the other part, Regardless of the dimension, that they, they can test using constantly many bits of communication. <laughs> it's used for people to test entanglement there. So this is one application, and it was important to have this metric group. Because to build that thing, you, you need uh, an efficient version of uh, quantum Fourier transform. You need to sort of diagonalize this thing, both diagonalize this thing efficiently. And whereas we knew some, some Ramanujan graphs that give quantum expanders, they did not have efficient quantum Fourier transforms for, for, for uh, let's say, LPS Ramanujan graphs. And for the symmetric group, we, we do know those. We get, get quantum expanders. We get improved versions of uh, monotone expanders, improved versions of dimension expanders. Th those are slightly less satisfying because we work with the notion of vertex degree. And they, they have all other notions of, of degree there. So it's a, uh, but uh, yeah, I think that the, the main application might be to the next distance, right? Whenever you have an expander graph, it can be transformed into this very generic way. So almost optimal explanation is something that, that can be achieved, right? Uh, whatever you start, I think that that's the main. And uh, being able to have these scaly graphs is useful for applications. So that's, uh, yeah, okay. So I think that's uh, enough. So I will conclude and let, let me know if you, if you guys have questions. Okay. Uh, there is also a okay, for compact infinite proof. Uh, you, 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 we can improve the, the trade off you know, for the average Cartesian constant. So, that, uh, in mathematics, people phrase the Cartesian constant as uh, there is some constant that you move, right? Uh, but uh, you can't, because we, we, this kind of result is a trade off between degree and, and expansion, right? Uh, and if you consider the average version of, of Cartesian constant, we sort of improve the trade offs there as well. That's nice. Do you need this? But you need to start with some expansion. We, we, this kind of machine will not generate expansion for you. It might make trade-offs better, right? Almost all trade-offs between degree and expansion. Do you need the conversion for uh, unitary representations instead of over an infinite dimensional space? Yeah, yeah. So the, the dimension is not important here in a certain sense. So you can somehow translate this result in a more abstract language, and it's dimension-dependent. Yes. 
over arbitrary Hilbert space. Exactly, you, you can do things over arbitrary Hilbert space because what the dimension is, it's completely, it's completely oblivious dimension. Or it works for infinite dimension. So I try to More questions? So we sort of plug it in instead of like in W like a high dimensional expander instead of like a uh, 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 um, to, to, to amplify or create a high dimension expander, but all that we, we have down here is very closely related to the zigzag and zigzag and then I think like in this W, the subset of F to the T. Ah, if you, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, at, at this point, it may change in the future. So uh, at some point, I was playing code in theory, and we, we construct some codes, just simplify codes based on high-dimension expanders. Currently, the, the rate is horrible. Uh, so it, it, for, for, it becomes some, I don't know, inverse exponential in, in, in this one over Epsilon. Whereas expander walks are, and, and Parkinson's construction is much, much better currently. So. A high dimension expander has a lot of multi scale expansion and get a lot of extra nice profits out of them, but potentially it might also be making the degree a bit larger than, than what it needs to be for, for some applications like this. Currently, the things might change, but uh, yeah. But you can you can do this simplification using uh, high dimension expanders at least the plus minus one, but I would imagine that also matrix version should be there. Thank you, guys.